Hello and welcome to Stand Up World episode 66. So glad you're here, back, new, fresh, accidentally stumbled onto it, watching at gunpoint. I don't know how you got here, but I'm glad you're here and um, we have a great show for you. You picked a, a good time to be forced to watch this if you did get and say hello to the producer, Patrick. Arnold, how you doing? Hey, Mike. Pat? I'm you good. Well? Very well. I'm so excited about today's show, and everything is good. Yes. Yeah, we got it's one of my favorite stand-ups. Yep. Yep. Buddy Hackett? No. <laughs> I was I was thinking of you this morning because we were talking about uh, that thing I had with my daughter about believe all women. Okay. You know, yep. We were talking about the other day, and and then I, and you know I was just thinking because you know anybody that knows me and you know is no I'm no Trump fan. You know I'm no Trump supporter. But there's just no way anybody with a, even a pea-sized brain believes that sometime between twenty and thirty years ago on some day unknown day in Bloomingdale's in New York, Trump, you know, uh, civil, legally, kind of, sort of, not quite rape, but assaulted that woman. There's just, no, nobody believes it. I'm sorry. Right, right. I'm yeah, sorry. you can. <laughs> right. You know, because first of all, he was a billionaire and a TV star at that point. And if he did do that, civil rape or sever, whatever, I don't know, she would know, not only would she know the exact date, because it would have been on the cover of New York Post that day, because she'd have run out onto the floor of the thing and go, he grabbed my pussy. <laughs> he grabbed me by the pussy. I need 10 million. She'd have cashed in right there. There's just no way she'd have just gone for it. And because, I mean, you can look at her, and I'm not making any claims about her looks, but I, but she does not seem bright enough to know that he was going to be the president one day, many years later. And if she does, she would have thought for sure he's a Democrat, which means he wouldn't have gotten charged for it, those crimes. <laughs> But there's just no way she wouldn't have written that down. Donald Trump, this is the day, this is the time, this is the moment. There's just nobody believes it. And we're all playing a game. We're all just playing a game. And it's so funny how we can all do that. Yeah, I guess just different levels. Like, I'm not on the same game as Trump, but yeah, you're right. You know, and... uh Look, you know, I didn't. I really didn't believe the woman that was making the claims against Biden, just because I don't think. I just. I think Biden's too goofy to do that kind of crap. You know, I just don't see him that way. I think he's got other sure, issues. Yeah. You know, but <laughs> but uh, I just I just think we're just in this goofy land where we all talk each other into believing stuff that we know is not true. You know. Yeah, that's true. Like you and I believe in anybody's actually listening to this podcast. Exactly. Okay. We're just Come on. talking ourselves into it, right? It's just you and I <laughs> and maybe my mother. <laughs> and Definitely I don't, mine. And I don't even believe she's listening. <laughs> so I you know why? You know why I don't believe she because I don't believe all women. <laughs> And that's a callback right there. That's a callback. Anyway, <laughs> God dang, I'm so, you know, Dan Soder is our guest today, for those of you who had to live through that last little <laughs> ramble. And I met Dan, I was directing an episode of the Showtime series Billions, where Dan was a cast member. And I did not know that he was a comedian. I wasn't back in the stand-up world at the time. I wasn't doing stand-up and I wasn't really... This and, was uh, in what, 2018? 20 what? 2018, this was like around that time? 
maybe 2017. Oh, wow. Okay. And, um, but Van was still kind of like well in the club scene, like working his way. He up was. Now, so. Yeah. It was. Right. Right. And we became friendly right away. And one night we went down to the cellar together because he was playing at the cellar. And, uh, it was my first time back at a comedy club in years, years. Wow. And he, he went, I went up and he was just so good and so real, you know, and, and, uh, Actually, we were, we saw Attell that night. It was the first time oh, I'd really? seen Attell in years, and we hung out with him afterwards. But uh, he's grown since then. You know, he's just – and he's got a great new special out on the road that is – I think he's added up a week. It's already got over a million views. But it, it, I I just – it's fantastic. It's, it's just – a. I just love Dan's style because Dan is so autobiographical. He, he, all his stuff is about his life and his, he just, he's just great. He's just really one of my favorite comedians, you know? And, and, the, and, and I, <clears throat> this special to me is going to build. This is good. I, I always say, tell him, I think it's the new live in Austin because it's so just down and dirty and it's, it, he just shot it and it's just it's just right. it's not there's nothing fancy about even the the stand up it's just just comes right. out you know it's, i love he's one of my favorite stand ups too he's just because he's so authentic and he's so goofy and silly but like all this stuff is so relatable and funny and he actually saw like that it's such a good point what you just said about it being sort of just like a stepping stone because there's so much more he could do like he i think he had one of the top 5 live performances i've ever seen I'll probably in 2021 at Laugh at Laugh Boston, and uh, I was like wondering what he was going to do with the material. I don't think I've seen it anywhere since because this was a lot of new stuff too, which was yeah. He's exactly. just such a great writer. Yeah. You know what? Let's get him on here, and I want you to tell him that about the Laugh Boston. Let's go, let's get him on here, okay? Let's do it. Or, or do you want to just, or maybe you want to talk we'll, about? We'll about, keep stroking uh, him a little. Uh, bit. Uh, I mean, I thought you might have something to say about uh, the, the lady that is accusing Trump. <laughs> no, no, I think we're good. I think we hit that nail on the head too hard. We're good. <laughs> Dan Soder! Dan Soder! How are you, pal? Good. How you doing, Mike? Good to see you. Yeah, man. How you doing? I'm doing really well. I'm doing really well, you know? I've been... Uh, I've been through it, but I'm doing great, man. Yeah, yeah, you made it through it. I made it through it, man. I, but I feel great. I, I, I really um back. I'm back with the living. <laughs> good, good, dude. It's good to hear. But um, I loved your your your. I know you don't like to call it a special. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm like you know, I'm growing to the idea because. I, I don't know if the word special describes what everyone's doing now. I like to call them. I think they they're albums, is what I think. Yeah, do. yeah, album. I that's actually a good way of saying it. it. It actually kind of felt like it was more of a EP than an LP, because I was you know only forty minutes. You know, I feel like here's like a shorter version of everything I'm doing on the road, and then you know it, it was YouTube, so I could cut it as as long as and as short as I wanted. And at one point, it was like fifty five minutes, and I was just like, dude, let's just put out forty of it. Cause I didn't like a couple of the jokes. So it was nice. It was the most freedom I've ever had putting anything out. And it was, it's going to be difficult to kind of go back to anything else. Uh, listen, I, I have a lot of thoughts on that, you know, because, because uh, doing this podcast and also one of the things that I'm working on with this platform I'm building, I, I think that getting locked into an hour, you know, the hour, and the word special comes from is a holdover from when all this stuff came off of network television. Yeah. And then we went to HBO specials and Showtime specials, and they were still programmed per hour. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even when I was, you know, like directing and making specials for Netflix, they were saying to me, the algorithms, the people aren't staying with them for the whole hour. You know, yeah, yeah. And some comics would want to do an hour and a half, and they'd say, "Please don't do an hour and a half." It's always wild to me when I'm on the route because my favorite thing on the road is talking to club managers because they're going to let you know what's really going on in comedy. They're like, 
these are people that have really the only vested interest they have is each weekend are they making are the shows running smoothly did anyone get hurt did anyone you know like the industry's dead like all those people that worked at networks and were just there to be nice to you and then they moved to another network and then you had like a relationship with them and they were like maybe i'll get you something if you're nice to me those people don't mean shit in comedy anymore because you're like fuck you i'll go right to the i'll go right to the the fans the people that matter are the managers of the comedy clubs and the wait staff of the comedy clubs because they listen to this shit all the time so they're the gauge of if you're making them laugh probably you got some original good shit or You know, it's just, but managers, I love asking them, like, what's, you know, who's doing what? And they'll tell me stories where they're like, this guy's doing like 90 a night. And you're like, that is inconsiderate on so many levels. It is ridiculous to do over 70 minutes of stand up. Such a good take. Such a good take, Dan. Very well said. It's you're sucking your own penis past the minute (laughs) 60. You are sucking your own dick. I, I, it's I so funny too. Yeah, I agree. And listen, especially in a on a, on a in a televised thing, whether it be it Netflix or YouTube, even you know, sure. because people don't have the, we we I you know it's not you can't say kids. Yeah. We our attention span has oh, yeah. been so fucked. Scuff. From reels, from Instagram, yeah. from everything, you know. I, I mean, I can't hold a conversation with my wife that long, you know. <laughs> I mean, I, I can't hold a conversation with anybody. Our our attention spans are so we're always moving on to the next thing. So to ask somebody to sit there and listen to more than an hour, insane. But when you say forty minutes, I, I think forty minutes. Your special did not feel truncated to me at all in any way. Good. Good. Yeah. You know, I do usually on the road, I do 45 to 50 minutes. This is what I, you know, like, um, I just think that's enough of me. <laughs> that's like, that's, that's plenty enough of me. And I think what it does is it gives like, uh, it gives a tight show and it kind of sometimes like, there'll be times where I get off stage and be like, Oh, I wanted to try this and this joke, but I didn't get to it. But if I'm in the moment and I didn't get to it, then it wasn't supposed to be got to, you know, it's like, um, that's right. If I if I have a conversation with you and I forget to say something, I'm not going to restart the conversation. You just go like, oh, next time I talk to Mike, I got to bring this up. Oh, like, or if I'm in the same town, I'll just come over late at night and knock on the door. <laughs> yeah. And I, there was something I forgot to yeah, tell. Yeah, I got it. I'm going to go bother people at home. I got one more joke. I had one more joke that I thought of. You, but, you know, the, the thing also is like like when I was, when I was a kid, we, we – we would do HBO specials. It was an hour. And then they started doing these one night stands. Yeah. That's where I came into comedy was, uh, I got really into when my, when my mom would get like a free weekend of HBO, uh, when, when cable companies would do that, like little preview weekends, um, they would put HBO one night stands. And that's where I got really into Pat Oswald, Dave Chappelle, um who was else on that season it was a specific season and the reason i got into it was it was all filmed in san francisco and uh my dad lived there and it was like a thing where i would go live there in the summers and so as a kid i was like san francisco where are they at in san francisco and then just became obsessed patents and daves and it was yeah i i actually i did the first season we all shot him in chicago yeah and it was Ellen DeGeneres and I shot one night, and then the next night, Robin Harris and I forget who, who oh, do you know Robin Harris? Did you know who that no. was? Robin Harris was this brilliant black comic. He was kind of like the Patrice O'Neill of his time. He, okay. he 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 was so great. Yeah, so funny and raw. And he actually had a series called Baby's Kids. Oh oh, I remember Baby's Kids. Yeah. Yeah, I, he was, I absolutely remember. We don't die, we multiply. I remember Baby's kids very well. So he was amazing, and he did it the next night. We shot these at a place called the Old Vic. We, we yeah, shot the, the Old Vic Theater. That's yeah. like uh, um, the one that I know specifically that was filmed there was Bill Hicks's One Night. Yes, Stand. yes, that's right. Same season. A- yeah. Anyway, anyway. Uh, so Ellen and I shot one night, and the next night Robin and someone else shot. And Robin went out to dinner that night because we had the same agent. Yeah. 
Went to dinner, went upstairs, went to bed, died in his sleep. No way. Yeah. No way. That night when you guys were taping all that stuff? He killed. He had a killer set. I mean, that's the, way, that's the way to go out, though, man. That's the way to go, go out. out. Go out on a good set. Yeah, a big steak dinner because we had the same agent, this guy, Bill Gross, this great guy. And yeah, uh, and and he had he he had a, they went out. They had this great steak dinner, and he went had he just got a standing ovation. Best way to go out in your sleep after a standing o and a steak, dude. That was like yeah. what a trifecta. But I will say there were things he forgot to do that night. He had jokes that he. Forgot. Oh really? No, I'm kidding. Oh, that's so funny. He's just he's haunting that hotel room. He's like, yeah. I had a joke about why white women be <laughs> dancing like this. <laughs> but yeah, dude, that's that's got to be the biggest regret if you're like, I didn't get that joke out. But no. um, but yeah, I think the half hours, you know, Netflix. Uh, when Robbie Pra took over, Netflix moved into the half hour space. And they did the stand-ups, and I got to be a part of that season. But I, I didn't really like the way my uh, set was handled by Netflix. I didn't really enjoy the process of that. So it's kind of made me leery to go back there in any way. Because they, like kind of like what we were talking about, where now you just go straight to the, to the, to the fan you just there's no middleman you go like here's what i make on stage here's my jokes and then you just like hand them over to your to the people and they're like do you like them or you, do you not like them and and i netflix, think that's why i think it's such a great time for stand-up yeah, yeah and netflix did the thing when they first started doing half hours where they were like you know i did my set i taped i taped with um nate bargetzi and fortune feimster and uh i went first on the taping which usually you're like well this 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 won't be the one and on the first show i went first and had my i just had so much fun and i fucked around i like made fun of the venue i had my set planned out and then in between sets robbie was like hey we've noticed the algorithm likes if people are uh, personal first so whatever personal joke can you move it to the front of your set and you know as a comic you're like well i have this set built like it doesn't the first joke hits in a certain way that i don't really feel like my family stuff is the strongest and that's why it's in the middle of my set and this is kind of like a joke and he was like no 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 that'll this will be the thing you know and it ended up uh, I ended up following Fortune, who fucking murdered. I mean, dude, on that second taping of that show, she Fortune was killing so hard that I kept thinking the set was over. I kept being like, oh, well, she's getting, nope, she's not getting off. Okay. Wow. And then sitting back down and being like, oh, hit. And then I went up after her, and it was clear that it was like, you know, mostly her fans. And her fans are like, who the fuck is this guy? And then I'm also like doing a set out of order. And after they taped it, I was like, cool, well, we're using the first show. And they were like, no, we're going to use the second show. And I was like, hey, that wasn't good. Like, I don't like that set. And Robbie was like, no, 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 that's that's the one because it opens with personal stuff. And I was like, Robbie, I don't. Why can't I use the first show? And he gave me some lip service about you made fun of the venue. And I'm like, so the fuck what? I don't give a shit about a restaurant that you turned into a comedy club for a night. And netflix stuck to their guns and used the second set and to this day to this day i get tweets when people watch my netflix show or the the stand-ups where they go i don't care what that audience thought i thought you were funny and you're like D what i don't want that out there like that's not i don't want that out there at all but netflix is like the algorithm and then people are like legitimately i think there were people walking around being like i don't think dan's good at stand-up and then no. you're like, no, uh, no, 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 I wouldn't have never, I would have yeah, never picked that. There's I'm no like, algorithm that says that we like personal shit first. Yeah. yeah. So that was kind of my experience where I was like, it kind of soured me. And then, you know, I was very lucky after that to do an hour special in 2019 HBO. With, with HBO. Yeah. And a HBO was, man, no notes. They were so fucking cool to work with. You know, I was lucky that I had Bo Burnham and Gerard Carmichael producing it. So that kind of gives you a little bit of yeah. you know suppression fire where they're kind of like, hey, we got you with the with the with the company. But HBO was fucking awesome. Yeah, they, they were just, were about stand up. Yeah. Yeah. They're just like, what do you want to do? And I would have a meeting with them and be like, I want to kind of shoot it like an old school 80s, 90s stand up special where it's no crowd shots, just stand up and 
And they were like, absolutely. They were just way on board with it. You know, Nina was at the taping um, and she left and she was like, I honestly haven't been to a taping like this in a while where I know there's zero edits that need to be done. Like we can just put that hour out. And it was really, really nice of her. And so it was really cool. And then, you know, this, this, uh, this time it kind of came around where, you know, Netflix isn't really paying specials as much as they're renting them. Yeah. And HBO was just kind of like, ah, eh, we're, you know, we're doing max, but my problem was, and this is where, you know, and Mike, I'm sure you've felt this way in your comedy career. There's sometimes you have an idea of what comedy is and you don't realize you're wrong. And then you realize you're wrong and it alleviates a lot of the problems. And mm -hmm. something that I was wrong about, and I'll willingly admit I was wrong, was I wasn't giving enough of my stuff away for free. I wasn't like giving the Costco sample so people could get back in line and buy the full product like hbo's behind a paywall netflix is behind a paywall i was at sirius xm which was behind a paywall and so all these people are like well if you if you wanted to hear me you had to go find me instead of kind of falling into me you know like youtube that's really interesting that's really smart like YouTube is just like, oh, this guy's funny. Let me click copy link and text it to my friend. And, and by my the friend way, can watch it right the way, there. When I saw, and I just told, <clears throat> I just told Patrick this. When I saw your special, I thought this is the new live in Austin. Oh man, thanks. I love Shane, so that means a lot. You know, I love Shane too, and I know, I know you guys are buddies. Yeah, we're real close. He's one of my but, best friends. But it's more than that. That special was free, yeah, and it, and it was just so. Not that it wasn't shot well; it was just just down and dirty. But yeah. the comedy was down and dirty. It wasn't fancy. It wasn't. It I mean, just it just came out of him. You know, brother, you are you're talking to the guy that uh, was following that act for two years. Uh, Shane was my feature, and I was watching him build that act, and I was going like. Jesus fucking Christ. I mean, I give Shane partial credit on the reason why my HBO special was good was because I was fucking following basically the the genesis of live in Austin. You know, obviously Shane started headlining and then built that hour set out. But like Special Olympics, uh, we should be racing them. Like all those jokes, I watched yeah. him come up with them. And he's he's one of my favorite comics to watch. Oh, yeah, me too. But but that special, you know, I don't know if you know, but I met him through you. I, you oh, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember yeah, that. I remember Nashville, introducing you guys. Yeah. Ryman, and, and we became friendly. And then we were talking, and he, he said that he really wanted to get a Netflix special. And I spoke to Robbie Pra, mm -hmm. and I said, and this is, I had Red Rocks coming out and I had another special coming out, uh, the uh, the birthing. And I said, you really, do you want, you should, and he had been fired from Saturday Night Live, but he was getting hot. I said, you should really think about doing a Robbie, uh, uh, Shane Gillis. And he said, I think he's great, but it's not going to happen here. He's got too much. And I said, you got to rethink it. You really got to rethink yeah, it. I mean, that was and what, anyway, what an oversight. We kept going back and forth. And I kept talking to him about it. And, and I said, you really, he, he, he wants to do a Netflix special. And he came back to me after a, 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 maybe about three months and said, we're going to make an offer. Nice. And I said, OK, great. And, and he, he said, um, but we're going to do it in this new world, which is Two hundred thousand dollars, and it's all in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, but there's nothing in there for me because you know I, I, that he, he'll do it with one of his buddies. That's fine. I'm not. I'm not that into directing other comedian specials anymore. Anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. plus I thought it was a bad deal, but fine, and which was good. It was great, and he made it. And he made, but to me. I thought Austin was a better special. I thought it was a great special. It did better for him, but I feel like if they had just treated him like the star he was at the time, he would have done a better special for them. Are you I mean, talking about Beautiful Dogs that came out? Yeah. Because yeah. I love that. I thought it was the I perfect, it too, I thought it was it was the perfect answer to 
I actually, I would be one of those people that would tell you I like Beautiful Dogs better than Live in Austin because I think it showed Shane's evolution in his joke writing with the Navy SEALs bit, with the George Washington story, with uh, yeah, his, uncle, his, his uncle Danny getting the grilled cheese, which is like just a classic bit. You know, I think I think we're in this age, I think we're in this age right now where kind of similarly to how I felt when I was a teenager and I was in college and I was getting into tough crowd. You know, I was a real big Opie and Anthony guy. I was a real big and and what it what's great is and what I'm seeing that's similar to the way it felt when I was a fan, you know, and I still am a fan. I would say like I got into Dave Attell, who was doing Insomniac. I was I'm a huge Colin Quinn fan. I'm a massive Colin Quinn fan. And so I would Colin's my guy. So like I would watch Colin and then I would see Colin kind of put on Greg Giraldo. Jim Norton, all these guys on Tough Crowd. I was into Jim Norton because of Opie and Anthony. And then, you know, I think Jim Norton right now is a top five working stand-up comedian. And it is so overlooked that it is fucking insane. I watched him do an hour at the Fat Black Pussycat about maybe a month ago. And I couldn't stop vomiting praise at Jim, which I know he fucking hates. But I just was like, he did this, you know, and I don't want to ruin it if he's going to do it as a special, but he does this chunk about marriage that is like anybody, you you would watch anybody do that and be like, what a great, what a great chunk about marriage. You know, he has this one specific joke where he's like, uh, the hardest part of marriage is blah, blah, blah. He's like, no, it's not, it's not fucking other people. And then he like goes on a run about what that is. And then midway through the marriage chunk, and not in a pat himself on the back way or trying to make a point way. He just points out that his wife is trans. And then he goes into all these jokes that are like not what you think someone would do with that situation where they're like, I'm married to a trans person, so I can say this. It's just like fucking heater after heater of a joke that you're like, oh, I was telling him to Norman and Norman was like, my God, like we were just like going nuts because he's like, I've always loved Jim Norton like that. I've always been like, dude, his standup is so fucking good. And so I feel like we're in a similar time where maybe someone loves Matt and Shane's secret podcast, right? And then they listen to an episode with Sam Talent and then they get to go get into Sam Talent and then they find out how brilliant he is or Nick Mullen Absolutely. or... I love I got I, I love Sam Talent. I think he's yeah. an underrated guy. He's he's the man. He's the king of Denver. He's the fucking I have to guy. Say though, he, he he I had him on the podcast set up to be on the podcast. Yeah. He blew me off. Well, you also got to understand that day. That day. He is a he is a vagabond. He is a he's a tramp. If if like Sam Talent's a guy where you won't hear from him for three months, and then you find out he's been living with Stanhope for six weeks, and you're like, oh, okay, that's where you've right. been. He's like a shadow yeah. in the wind in he, outer space. He probably you know is I mean? the like, closest we have to Stanhope. He's our new Stanhope. <laughs> he, without without the bit, he has a bit about an Uber driver that is so fucking brilliant. To me. Yeah, he's brilliant. He's always been that guy. And, and his always... book, his book is the best book I've ever read about stand up comedy. Agreed. I mean, it's a novel. It's not a book about. Yeah, that. it's called it's called Running the Light, and if you oh. haven't read it, it is. Uh, it made me cry uh, twice it. in a hotel room. I love that guy. So we had him here, just like you. I'm, I'm like I did the preamble with you, yeah. and then, oh, hey, Sam Talent, and Patrick's like he's not here. He's not. <laughs> here. And I texted him. He didn't come. So I just said fuck it. I just I spent 45 minutes bagging him. And I love it. Yeah, I, hey man, if you ain't gonna show, if you're I, out here to I defend was yourself, the episode not Sam Talent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude, but it that's kind of the way I feel that it is, where you can like find these people. You know, that's why that's why like the people I bring on the road are. I kind of think about like um, like twenty one year old me when I would go to comedy shows. Like I remember seeing Dave Chappelle and Greer Barnes open for him, and I was like. Greer's unbelievable. And so you just kind of like, you know, I think we're kind of in this cool era with like a little bit kind of like bands where you're like finding people that go on tour with each other. And, and, you know, uh, Burt Kreischer has been real cool about that. You know, yeah, he is. that's one thing me, I respect uh, the hell out of Burt Kreischer. I love Burt, man. He's been so fucking open and, and, and welcoming and like, you know, Burt, Burt, Burt is not afraid to have 10 murderers, five, eight murders before him. 
Dude, he had fucking, last year on Fully Loaded, he was following Big J, he was following Chad Daniels, he was following guys that I was like, dude, what the fuck? That is a... He's got like a Tell, Stavros, Cheeto, like everybody on these lineups is crazy. And we're running it back this year, you know, I'm doing the full Fully Loaded tour with Bert this year, and it's like me, Big J, Attell, Ralph Barbosa, uh, Hingecliffe, there's just people that you're like, Jesus Bert Bert is amazing that way. And Rogan's that way too. Yeah, Rogan. man. That was I just did comedy mothership and there's that feeling there of like, oh man, yeah, come in and jam. And you know, I'm a big Adam e- Egit guy. I'm a huge Norm McDonald fan. So I anytime I get alone with Adam, I'm just like, dude, tell me podcast stories. I just want to know about Norm. I just want to know about his gambling. I just want to know how fucking nuts he was. Cause I think pound for pound, the funniest human being ever to live was Norm McDonald. I think he is oh, like. Oh, I think it is. Who? I've come to realize David Tell. <sighs> I don't think I can argue that. I don't know, man. I, uh, I'm i so excited for his Netflix special because. I saw it. I saw it. Oh, how great is it? It was yeah. at Cobb's. It was at Cobb's, which I love that room. Yeah. He, he was on the he on the podcast last week and so he sent me the link and it is oh. it is such a great special it's yeah. so it's so is David tell it yes. just it just it nails him in the same way that I feel on the road nails you right? oh thanks and and um by the way I was just telling Patrick I hadn't seen a tell in years yeah and I was, directing an episode of billions and you and i became buddies and oh yeah yeah, i remember that night you came by the cellar and i came by the cellar and i tell was like is that binder with you dude he went nuts because i went over to talk to dave about something and you were like at the bar talking to someone and yeah. Dave broke his and i conversation and he went is that mike binder and i went yeah that's mike binder and he was like mike it was like dude he's the fucking man i mean yeah. you know i i would consider dave Attell and colin quinn the two most influential stand-up comedians ever in New York City. I think anyone that's ever came out of New York City has been influenced by either Colin Quinn or Dave Attell. Um, you know, I, like you look I at would say, you know, that 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 uh seller scene was not my scene. Yeah. Not my world, you know, but there are, you know, being such a comedy store LA guy in my era, but you know, so many great comics, guys, so, like you say, Norton and oh, yeah. and, and Bobby Kelly, Rich Bobby Voss, Kelly. Keith Robinson. I by mean, the way, by the way, I have to say, and I've been talking about this. One of the funniest hours on television is the Rich Voss special. Shout oh, out. I love Rich. Rich the what? The roast the of Rich Foss. That's what oh I meant. Oh my god! The roast Dude, of Rich Foss. It was so that that roast was so packed when they were taping it that I listened to it sitting on the stairwell of the Village Underground, going into the room because uh, I, there was just no seats available because it was like so packed. And that was like uh, there's only been two times in recent memory that i've like sat in a hallway and listened to a show and just died laughing and it was the rich voss the rich voss roast and uh ron bennington did an unmasked with wow. david david tell at skank fest in like 2018 or 19 and it was like there were like me and like norman and like five other comics just like sitting behind a curtain just listening to bennington interview a tell because the room was so packed but it was like, I mean, the, uh, the Voss roast, Colin Quinn set, Jim Florentine. Fucking Jim Florentine ripped. had the best joke I've ever heard in a raw a roast. He says, you know, to, to Bonnie, he goes, Bonnie came from Ca- from Canada, and she she her dreams came true. She, she got stupid rich. That's funny. That's so fucking funny. Yeah, dude, I love Florentine. I love Florentine so much. He's just so funny. Like, he's just a guy when I see him, I'm just immediately like, oh, dude, I want to talk to Florentine forever. And then he showed up. You know what I love about these roasts that that live forever? Because another one is um, the 2002 Patrice roast from the Boston Comedy Club. Uh, Patrick from The Stand had the audio. And now it's online. They found the video. So they put it on YouTube. So you can go watch it on there. Oh, I got to see it. And- By the way, this Patrick, 
I don't know if you know this guy, but he works for John Tobin, who has all the Laugh Boston and all oh, the. Yeah, yeah, fuck yeah. Yeah, yeah. He, yeah, said, we, he was yeah, telling me one of the best sets he ever no, saw no. was you at Laugh Boston. He was telling yeah, me. It was your 2021 set I think we had all these like it was because I just started working for John and Ryan like that summer and it was all these COVID like reschedules you know what I mean so oh yeah yeah it, yeah, yeah. it was like one that we had at laugh was crazy right before everybody went to the Wilbur and but the I saw you and Shane that summer and it was just I'd never heard laugh that loud and you guys just put on such a complete hour that it was just oh, like yeah. wow it was by far like two of the best live performances I'd ever seen it was such a yeah cool that was thing. fun as hell what that I was, was saying like, me and was like seen. yes you were seen but i was like i remember so many i mean i remember the jokes but it seemed like this on the road hour or like special you put out was just sort of like super loose and fun and yeah. whereas like that set you were like you were crafted and like almost like attacking the jokes differently but yeah, nonetheless I, so cool to see and it's just as funny so yeah i think man like i think that's kind of what our, our point was at the beginning now is that now you can just truly show what you're doing on the road and there, is, there isn't that like interference of people being like, um, you're you're not getting notes. It's fucking right. beautiful. Right. I was gonna say, yeah, no one's telling you to put the family stuff. First, it's you know? it's, it's just beautiful. Yeah. It's just like people, you you know, like um, homeless pimp who does my uh, love him. You know, he he's he produces my podcast. He he fucking runs you know runs my social he's media. Man. He's the man. And, and I asked him at JFL two years ago. I was like, how do you sleep? And he was like, I really don't yeah dude he's crazy but he he had such a workload and um you know he was kind of becoming burned out this is before we were working together and he's kind of like yeah i'm 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 scaling it down a lot i'm stopping working with a lot of people and i'm only going to do a, a few people or whatever and it was probably one of the most honored i've ever felt in my life because he, he works with me nate bargetsy and colin quinn those are the three yeah. people he works with now wow. and you know my agent Mike, who I love to death, was like, hey, you should just, you're like on the road a lot in the fall and in the winter. He's like, you should just, you want to tape it? And I was like, fuck, man. You know, I didn't have, because you know how it is, Binder. There's like, you've been on both sides of it. When you, when you decide to film something, then your agents go, okay, well, we're going to approach Netflix or HBO, and we're going to see if there's any interest on their side. And then if there is, they got to come back to you and go, we're looking at the third quarter of whatever and all that fucking, you know. <laughs> and and my agent was like, hey, you love Portland Helium. You want me to book a Wednesday, Thursday there? And and then you can, you know, I was doing Friday, Saturday at Cobbs. And I was like, yeah, let's do Wednesday, Thursday at, at Helium. Did the did the shows, you know, sold them out, turned around, took the money from selling them out, paid Homeless Pimp. That paid for the filming, you know, um, brought my 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 buddy Kevy in from Canada, who's an awesome musician. And he was like, I'm going to make the sound really great. That's all I cared about. Was, See, was but like, that's what getting back to it. That's what I loved about it. And yeah. that's why and that's why I loved Live at Austin. And who was also who was also Homeless Pimp. That was also him. And, him and, him, way, him and way, I, I love beautiful dogs, but it just, to me, it, it fell in the crack. It, it didn't have $500,000 to do a uh, paper tiger. Yeah. yeah, or, yeah. Or, oh, or paper tiger, by the way, you know, it gets, it gets, I think COVID hit and it got kind of swept under the, a lot of the specials, mine included, got, got really swept under the rug right when COVID hit. But the fact that paper tiger we, you have to take a second of how beautifully it was shot, how well I love the way you directed it, but also the fact that Bill Burr made Royal Albert Hall feel like a 75 seat comedy club the way right. he was fucking killing. Right. It That's was right. unbelievable. But, it was, it, it, people don't understand that how large that room is and for Burr to make it sound like they were like it was like a fucking two drink minimum in there. But but the thing about what I was saying was he, he spent the money had them mm -hmm. do it right yeah and and I, and I would have liked to have seen shane do that and so it, so it was completely different than what the homeless pimp special was yeah to have the difference to feel to feel the difference and uh I, I will tell you i'll tell you you talk about notes the greatest note story and 
Rob, you probably won't like this story, but I don't care. But he, he will. He will understand. I don't think he's going to like any of the stories that have been told about him so far. I won't be surprised if I get a text where he's like, I didn't he, say you had to use the first And you did. You said I had to use the first show. My favorite story is, and, uh, you know, we he looks at the first cut of, of it. And we don't, I don't hear from him. No one hears from him. But I'm at the store one night, and we're going to go smoke a cigar with Burr up on the roof. And uh, he's there. And I go, I go, hey. He goes, hey, I saw the cut. I like it. Uh, we got to talk to Bill about uh, that one trans joke. And it wasn't really a trans joke. It was just, it was, it was a reference about a pilot with something on his head. Yeah. And, and I go, well, talk to Becky. Tell Becky. Don't, don't, don't tell Bill. And he's, I'm meeting him here in a minute. Please don't say that to him. Bill, Bill doesn't like to hear notes from me. You know, yeah, yeah. I'm the director, and he just tells me off. And yeah, I one, get, of the, one of the li- gr- li- greatest living comedians. And you're like, yeah. I, I, I so got anyway, there. Bill shows up, and we're heading upstairs. And I, he goes, Rob, you want to come up and smoke a cigar with us? He goes, yeah, I'll follow you up. So we're going up the steps, and I hear him. Robbie, he goes, special's great, special's great. I got one note. I got a note about the uh, trans joke. And I hear Bill go, why would I want a fucking note from a Weasley little executive after I've been doing this thing 25 years in this business? I don't want to hear shit from you about notes. Yeah. And he goes, no, it's just one thing. He goes, I don't want to hear one thing. I don't want to hear any fucking thing from you about this. Yeah. And, and I, I, oh, my fuck. First of all, I. The guy, don't bring it up. Second I mean, of all, I love you, you got the warning, you know. I got the warning, and and I knew. I mean, Bill was giving me that kind of back. Mike, you're the director. I don't want to hear any fucking things. Yeah, you dude. Know, but guys, but guys, know. guys, done all right on his own, you know. <laughs> it's told, like I told Chappelle that story one night at the Gramercy. He did think I told him that story, and he he got up and he walked around the room laughing. He goes. I'm not that gangster. I can't believe that motherfucker's yeah, that dude. gangster. Dude, Burr, I remember right after Shane got fired from SNL, uh, Burr was doing a set at the stand, and Shane was doing a set. Like, Shane went up or whatever, and Burr walked in with his Patriots hat, you know, fucking curled or whatever, and he sat down, and he goes, Soder, is this the guy that got fired from SNL? I went, yeah. And he, like, sat there, and he listened for, like, three minutes, and he goes, yeah, he's funny. He'll be all right. <laughs> That's all I did. He's just like he just sat there and listened for like he just sat there and li- listened to like one joke and he went, "Yeah, he's funny. He'll be okay." Yeah, he's like, "He'll be all right." <laughs> and you're like, "Yeah, dude." And that was like at the moment it happened, and you're like, "Dude, that's yeah." Burr's one of the uh, Burr's one of my all time favorites. He's a guy that like he was the example I was given with Opie and Anthony, where I learned about him and Patrice through Opie and Anthony, and then it just started this obsession where I would go find anything I could find with Bill Burr. And then, you know, he started his podcast and it was like that kind of, you saw the, you know, the rise. And you know, if you look at it, I really think a lot of the credit for where standup is right now and where the boom happened goes to Louis CK in 2007 with shameless, the mix of shameless. Um, it's a, it's a mix of a couple of things. Lucky Louis getting canceled on HBO yeah. because then that just set Louis out on the road. Shameless which is just, I mean, his HBO One Night Stand. Louis won HBO Wait, One Night Stand. And also live at the Comedy Store. Well, that was after. That was like four things yeah. after. I'm talking about when Louis, when Louis really started breaking, his HBO and Bill Burr. It, and, you know, Patrice wasn't as, as good, and there's like an article about how Patrice didn't like his HBO, but HBO One Night Stand did it at, um, at NYU, at the Tisch performing arts center and they did um that lineup that year was fucking crazy it was bonnie mcfarlane um bill burr patrice o'neill louis ck jim norton uh and like um a couple of i think kevin brennan and a couple other people and bill burr's set I, and i've talked to big J about this i've talked to people that were actually there like younger comics that went and watched the tapings and they said bill burr showed up nate bargetti was the one who actually told me this story he said you'd see Bill around town or whatever and Bill would like murder and you'd be like, Oh, Burr's hilarious. And then he did his comedy central half hour, which was pretty good. The presents where he's got like the, you know, 
um, women fucking old men for money bit, which is great. And then they said the HBO half hour, he showed up to that taping and everyone walked out of the room like, what the fuck? They were like, Bill Burr is unbelievable. And Louis also did that HBO one night stand and, and everyone was like, holy fuck. Louis like style was different. It was a lot more personal. And then Louis goes on to do Shameless. And then it's like you have all these people kind of coagulating right at the right time. And it just blew the doors open. So young guys like Nate and me and, and, and a lot of people that were like really big fans of it watched it and were like, holy fuck, this is how you do comedy. Like I, I remember watching Burr at the New York Comedy Festival in 08 or 09 and leaving to go do guest spots and like open mics and being like, all right, well, I got to get my shit up. Like, I got to learn how to write better. I got to learn how to be it's better. It's really funny. When I got back to do the Comedy Store documentary, and I was so out of comedy for years, personally, for personal reasons. I, I, sure. I actually, like, shut it down, you know, yeah. like, like, like I shut down my drug use. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I get it. A very similar, very similar feeling. Because I, I, you know, as much as I could... I love talking comedy, as you can see. And, yeah. And I was like that every night of my life from the time I was 16 to the time I was. Yeah, it is a drug. 30 some years old. And, but I shut, I shut it down and, and everyone would say, you know, our, the eras of, it was of Robin and Letterman and Leno. That was the golden age and the golden yeah. age of the store. And when I got back in and I realized, no, the golden age was Rogan Burr. And it was another yeah. golden age. And then, and, and I would say that to the guys from my, with Jim Carrey and Howie Mandel. And, and, and then I've real, I've come to realize doing stand up world, this platform I'm building and back being a stand up comic. This is the golden age. Well, I think it's all, I, mean, I, mean, if you, I think it's all, that, I think it's all like a, I don't think it's like a, um, a one and done kind of situation. That's my point. Stand up yeah. has gotten stand up has gotten so strong. Well, honestly, I I I I could replace everyone, Robin Letterman, Leno, you know, with with a new guy on every level, from from Burr's era, from Louis era to your era. Now these guys, and 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 when I see these people popping all the time and i can give you 10 people that are coming up behind you oh, that yeah. I are going to be monsters yeah and, there's a there's a guy named jeffrey asmus who oh, I, i've had him on here yeah, he was our very him. first interview guest actually yeah, yeah. He, um he's he's hilarious. i did a bar show in 2019 or 2018 and i uh i did my set or whatever and then i popped back in I, like when i went outside and got high and i came back in and i saw this, this guy is doing this joke about sports rivalries and about how the World Cup is like actually rivalries because there's war between the countries. And I was like, what a fucking brilliant joke. And then I, I like asked his name and I forgot it. And then I went on Bert's podcast and I was like telling Bert about this young guy that does this joke. And then Asmus reached out and he's like, hey, you were actually talking about me on Bert's podcast. And then I was like, dude, come on the road with me. And he came on the road with me and I was like, dude, this guy is so fucking funny that every it's one he's one of those guys where every fucking word is 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 on purpose reminds me a little bit of of how precise michelle wolf is michelle wolf is like every word has a purpose and everything moves you towards the punchline her writing is phenomenal and it was like man see an asmus you're like there is not one breath wasted every well, yeah what about carmen lynch love carmen lynch he's i amazing. love carmen lynch She's it's amazing. amazing. Her show, she, and her, like, to me, every word is in place for a reason on that, in her act. Well, you know who I'm really excited about is Adrienne Iappalucci. Just, oh, uh, she filmed her. a special at the cellar directed by Louie. And oh, I've been bothered. You know what's funny is I've been bothering her all day because Ari and Louie are helping her with it. And I saw her last night at the stand and I was like, dude, she was talking to me about my special. I'm like, fuck my special. Send me yours. I want to watch yours. Because we are. We're in this age where you're like, oh, I want to I want to hear that album before it's out. Yeah. Kind of like music. <laughs> well, that's the way I feel about your yours too. I mean, you did this bit. <laughs> you have this bit I was telling my wife about it, about you, 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 you Instagram will just tell on you. You know, I, yeah. I, I like this, but 
30,000 people liked it and Jeff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's funny because Asmus was on the road with me and he's like, I hate that the name of that joke is Jeffrey. And I was like, it's not about you. It's definitely not right. about you. But, it, you know, it's like, um, you know, that was such a, a, a fun set just because it was like zero pressure, kind of like what we were talking about. It was, I think that's why, um, I think that's part of the reason why it's been received the way it is, is because yeah. the, I think people can tell that there isn't a lot of like, uh, corporate meddling with it. it and really I feel smart. like it was so smart of you to do this. And I'll tell you something. Do you know, Catherine Blanford? Yeah. I've heard, yeah. I know that name. I don't know she's them personally. Fantastic. She's a murderer. Yeah. I don't know her personally, but, but she's really, she's filming her special this weekend and she's, she, she, she She's someone, you know, most people, most young comics and right now, they, they, they're just so obsessed with Netflix or HBO. Yeah. And yeah. They, they, but she said to me, I'm filming my special and I'm just going to put it on YouTube. Exactly what she, you said. She goes, because I want it free and I want to, I want to give away. I want people to see it. I want to sell tickets. That's exactly, I mean, that's it. That's and, it. I mean, that, that was the reason I called it on the road. That It's not a Jack Ker Kerouac. I'm not like trying to be artsy. <laughs> I literally couldn't find a title for it, which, by the way, immediately Colin Quinn watched it and sent me notes. And I was like, I should have called it Alcoholic Hamlet. Uh, I don't know why I didn't call it that. Um, but, you know, on the road, it was it's kind of like um, it's not a title as much as it is a suggestion where it's kind of like, hey, this is what I'm doing on the road. So if you like this. Well, so what I liked about it is, and by the way, this is so good for the algorithm. It was so personal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the algorithm, algorithm, loves it. Loves it. algorithm really loves it. Clearly, really I mean, that's why it's got so many views. That bit with the st your stepfather when you go and you say, you go, I saw him swim and I thought, I'm not going to be able to take him out in the water. <laughs> yeah, dude, that's fucking hot. He's in the air or on his land. <laughs> you know what's fun about that joke is like, um, it's all real. Like everything, a lot of times with comedy, you get stuff and like people are like, ah, no, no, that was based on a thing. I've had jokes like that. I'm not saying I don't do that. I'm saying like, but that joke specifically, it was uh, everything about it was 100% real. And my friend, one of my oldest friends in the world, my buddy Byron, who I grew up with, he's watched that special and he he's a, a commercial electrician in in Florida. You know, guy like is like running an electrical thing. He's like, you know, big time electrician. And he, he fucking texts me. He's like, dude that was real. Like, do people know? And I was like, you used to go to those swim meets with me. He's like, I know I had to go to those swim oh, meets. With I can tell you this, by the way, how you described the air and the jacket oh. you were wearing. Was, oh my God. No, nobody, nobody watches that thinks that isn't real. Yeah. That was like one of those. And, and I, I kind of hope that dickhead saw that joke. I hope it got to him somehow. Cause <laughs> he's he still fucking... married to your mother. No, he was never my stepdad. He was my mom's boyfriend. He was, he was legitimately my godfather. He was my oh. dad's ex best friend. Oh, I and, uh, no, nah, and he was, um, yeah, they used to, they used to get real drunk and call me retarded. <laughs> that was like the thing where he would be like, that was, you know, what's fun. And this is, and I'm sure you've gone through this with stand up. when something in life sucks and then years later, you kind of turn it into something that's fun. You get this feeling of like, it was kind of worth it. <laughs> You're like, it was kind of worth it. And <laughs> I remember specifically my mom and him would get, you know, my mom since apologized. My mom's the best. So my mom is like apologized and been like, listen, that was a bad time in my life. I was drinking heavy. I'm sorry. Like she's apologized. We've had, we've had real come to Jesus meetings about that kind of time of my life. Cause it was the worst time of my life where my father was off dying and my, my, uh, my mom and her boyfriend were kind of reveling in it. And I was kind of stuck in between some that's where that divorce joke comes from about me being, I have some yeah. news. <laughs> yeah, because my mom would just sit there and talk shit about my dad, and then my dad, I'd go see my dad. Well, I, I didn't really see. Him. I'd see my dad like once every couple of years, and then my dad would just fucking him and my, his family would just shit on my mom. So I'd just like go between the two, being like, "Well, they're saying this, and you're saying this." But as a child, yeah, uh, yeah. and I remember <laughs> being a kid and my mom's boyfriend being like, you're fucking retarded because I, you know, spoke incorrectly and he'd be like, you're going to pump gas. You're going to fucking pump gas for a living. And I remember being like 12 <laughs> years old and in my head going like, 
Yeah, I think there's like two states that do that, Joe. Like there's two <laughs> states where people pump gas for a living. Everything else is self serve, and then to yeah. use that punchline fucking 28 years later you know what i mean and be like oh i remember thinking that in my brain and then it goes into the joke and you're like fuck yeah man <laughs> like fuck yeah fuck you joe rewarding like as hell yeah. let me let me tell you something and we were talking about this earlier i won't keep you too much longer but i just love talking shop with you dan you oh yeah dude i'll fucking talk i'll talk comedy all goddamn day dude but, but you know one of the reasons that i think stand up is so perennial now and is so it's all become one giant golden age is from kind of Richard Pryor, Lily Tomlin on the best. It, it became through Sarah Silverman. And then as you say, Louis, another one of the best. I mean, it, I love Sarah Silverman. It, it became so much memoir yeah, and so personal yeah. that, it, that, it, that it, it started to take the same emotional shelf space in people's lives that great music did and great songs did. Whereas if you were in a breakup or if you could see a special and you go, God, I have that same thing. I relate to that so much. And it, and it wasn't just old guys telling mother-in-law jokes. Or yeah. You know, there was a, there was a moment, man. And I'd probably say one of the greatest, greatest honors of my career um were in that hbo special i got to really talk about what it felt like losing a, a father that was a shitty father you know like having your dad die and him not being a good dad and kind of the because that kind of you know i've had friends that have lost dads but they've all lost dads that they loved and it was weird to be like yeah i mean i i think i loved my dad he just wasn't really around so i don't really know if i did and, you know, I had this part in my HBO special where I said, um, people with dead dads love dead dad jokes. You know who doesn't like dead dad jokes? People with living dads. And I was like, and it's weird. And I got into that and I really got to break down the feeling of like laughing about shit. My grandmother just passed away two weeks ago and she was 97 and I've got like 10 minutes on it right now. And it just feels so cathartic to be like, it's not sad. She's 97. That's what they should do. They should be dying at 97. It's like, and it, it's, it's a great feeling to have someone go like, I'll see people in the audience when I'm talking about her breaking her hip and being at this facility and how fucking sad the facility was. Watching people go like, yes, like you just see people being like, fuck it. I had this joke. Uh, it's on the special on, um, on the road where I was in Chicago doing shows. I did like eight eight or nine shows at Zany's in a row. And uh, Katie, my fiance, was with me. And she's the best. She's just the greatest part of my life. There's no one I love more. It's just she's the love of my life. And she loves comedy. And she like loves watching me do comedy. But she gives me notes that are like, only, the only note I could get is from the person that knows me the best. And I was starting to do that joke about um talking shit to yourself during sex about how you make a noise in your head and you're like what the fuck was that <laughs> and then i was like you know like oh does that feel so good oh does that feel so fucking good and i would i would do that and it didn't work that well it would like get kind of a laugh but i got off stage one night at zany's in chicago and katie and i were having dinner and katie goes you did that joke and i watched four guys reach towards you like you're a fucking preacher like like reaching like yes yes i fucking do that like i talk shit to myself in my head during sex and what's great about that note is it's kind of the opposite of what we're talking about with with corporate notes where it was someone that knows me someone that loves me someone that knows that this is coming from a real place that i find funny and it's not malicious having her go like keep 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 doing that you know, it's like when a big comic, like Attell one time told me a joke years ago that I did about homeless people. He goes, that's funny. You should do that more. And I was like, oh, well, that's it. Because I think in a com as a comic, and you know this, you know what, you're like a mechanic. You know what works and what doesn't work. So when someone goes like, I think that could work, you go like, yeah, I think actually that could work. And in that moment where Katie was like, no, I watched a guy respond to you in a way that was like, oh, fuck, I feel that way. And that completely changed because I probably would have discarded that joke if it just like wasn't working that well. I'd have been like, ah, I thought it was a good idea, but I guess it wasn't. So having someone close to me be like, 
Oh no, no, no. There were guys that were fucking feeling that. And yeah, they were like being emotional. And yeah. I, I think that's the thing. I think I think stand up is just kind of living in a deeper chord in people's lives than it used to. Well, you know what's so weird is I never understood stylistically kind of where I was because I under you know, I like we'll talk about it. I'm I'm obsessed with it. I've always loved stand up and I love talking it. I love fucking breaking it down. And I know there's a lot of people online that don't. But I love it. I can listen to people break down stand up all fucking day. It's what I do for a living. It's what I love. The, it's what I love to do the most. So it's like I always want to talk about it. And I, I did a show with Joe List. Joe List and Jason Cantor had the show on the Upper East Side, and it was like me, T.J. Miller, Mark Norman, and Louis C.K. And um, I went up, and then Louis went up, and then like a couple other people and Mark, and we were watching Norman in the back, and I was like man, he's so tight. Like his words are so tight or whatever. And Louie just goes like, well, yeah, stylistically, he's completely different from you. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I knew that. But then he goes, well, your comedy is emotional. It's all based on emotions. It is. And he said it in a way that I was like, huh, I've never thought of it like that. And he's like, well, that's what it is. And then I jokingly went, fuck man 40 years you can diagnose something quick huh and he goes yeah <laughs> and he was just like matter of fact about it he was like well yeah, just, yeah, I can tell to you be that. honest i mean that that i could say that yeah. i think my mother could come see you and know that that's what you do but i don't think i think it could, i saw you I, no, I, 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 I see what dan's saying though because it's like there's some guys like mark who are just no fat words only words only yeah. and there's some guys who like make you buy like you sell your act a little more you kind of sell your soul a little more give a piece of yourself more you know i, I yeah, get it yeah, but, but, but if you know mark norman's a one-liner you i mean dan you do that's what's great about you uh, first time i saw you at the at the cellar you were doing the stuff about your dad and your, your yeah. dad and and when we were doing billions you were saying, yeah, man, I'm at this cool place where I'm talking about my dad. And, and, and you weren't telling me what you were doing, but you were saying, and I'm dealing with a lot of shit. And, and then yeah. when I saw you, you went out at the cellar that night and you dealt with it all. And you could see, like I say, you know when it's real. You know when yeah. it's real because you're saying, and that night and I was wearing a sport jacket that my dad would say it was too tight. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know when it's real. And that's what Pryor and that's what the people that do that. And that's what Louie does. And yeah, Sarah I mean, does. you know, I, I remember the joke that clicked for me on Louie of being like, oh, it was the, um, you know, you, uh, you can never answer your kids questions. He's like people without kids. You know, he's like I was watching these people online, and it was the French fry joke. It's from his his uh, one night stand, where he goes, um, you know, where the parent goes, "Shut up and eat your fries." And he goes, "People without kids would go like, oh, I would answer all my child's questions." He goes, "You can't, because it's fucking impossible." And he's like, one time my daughter wanted to go outside and play. She said, "Could we go outside and play, Papa?" I said, "No, it's raining." And she said, "Why?" I said, well, the sky is falling, you know, and he does that whole bit where he's like, and I'm going to spare you guys because this just keeps going on and it gets weird and absurd. And she's like, why? He's like, well, because what is can't be what isn't because then there'd just be like shit, like bugs wearing top hats. Right, and right. he's like, <laughs> and then at the end, he's like, just eat your fucking fries. And you're like, yeah. I, I, you just know that that moment happened to Louis and Louis was like, oh, well, this is, uh, you know, and then that leads him to doing the joke of my kid's an asshole. You know, if you yeah. if you can't leave the house because someone won't put their shoes on, that person's an asshole. And you're like, oh, my God, dude. It's just, yeah, man, I fucking love. I, I my love favorite that Louis joke, the one that turned me on to Louis, because, again, that was another comic that I was kind of, I knew Louis as a writer for Chris Rock. Yeah. And, and, and I didn't really and I knew him because Michael Rotenberg was both our managers, I believe, you know, and that's how I. But but I heard him on this. On, on, I forget which album it was. But he did a bit about the twin He goes, and masturbation is so shameful, and and you know, there's so much to be shameful about it. But the worst is when you know, if you if you masturbate with, after 9 11. Yeah, that's the joke that got him kicked out of the cellar. And he for got me, for me, he goes, for me, it was when. The two I masturbated in between the two towers. Going. Yeah, he said. He said you can tell how big of a piece of shit you are with how how soon after right. the towers fell you jerked off. He goes, for me, it was in between towers. And <laughs> he did that joke on the twelfth or the fourteenth of September two thousand one. Wow! Like, like the seller comics will tell you, Louis went up and did that joke two days after nine eleven, and Damn. Gnome 
uh, Gnome's father, um, Manny, who owned the cellar, was like, no, that's inappropriate. And like, I think like suspended him for like a week or two was like, no, you can't do that. But Bobby Kelly told me the story. He was like, yeah, dude, Louie did that joke like fucking two days after 9-11. And you're like, that's insane. That's insane. What's crazy now is like, um, well, by the way, do you know that it tell a few days after 9-11 did the joke said he couldn't, uh, he couldn't get a, a flight out. <laughs> yeah. Do you know that, that joke? No, I don't know that joke. He goes, I, yeah, I couldn't get a flight out from, from the from the towers straight out. That's why. <laughs> so he's he's his new. I'm so excited to watch his new special. I'm so excited to watch. Fuck. Dan, you were talking about like you were listening to O and A and all like Colin Quinn and these like iconic old comedy things that were just sort of like staples of the comedy community. And like I think that like like we've been talking about is now podcasts. What do you think? Like, are there any younger characters of the comedy world that are like? Because the one that comes to mind, at least for me, is like a Sean Gardini, who's like in like a perfect oh, yeah, comedy I love school, for lack of a better term. Yeah, because he's just like learn like listening to sh- like Matt and Shane all day, twenty four seven. And I yeah, imagine Matt and Shane he's are have like... an amazing career. You know what I mean? So who who are these younger guys that you're excited about that are just around that you like like Bargatze, I mean, the like whole Shane, Shane camp. like everybody. The whole Shane camp is incredible. You got Sean yeah, Gardini, you got Lemare. <laughs> but you also got stuff island guys who have been around for a while chris o'connor and tommy pope yep. who are hilarious in that whole philly scene but i think in new york city you've got a lot of young guys that are just kind of like um that are they're doing it right like besides the jeffrey asmus there's like a lot of uh really f- will noonan uh yeah i love will noonan out of will boston amazing, i love man. will he's will's like one of the last of the mohicans in boston dude yeah he's, he's like one of those <laughs> yeah, last guys <laughs> coming up uh, but I think there's like a ton of young comedians. And what's great about it now is like what I love about it is seeing them nerd out on comedy as hard as I did, because you kind of like my group of friends, Joe List, Mark Norman, me, you know, Michael Che, uh, Dan St. Germain, Mike Racine, like all these guys that were at the Creek, the first Creek in Queens we all had that thing where we were lucky that we had the creek at that time because we got to experiment and fuck around and i got to watch incredible comics like sean Patton and and like kyle canane and rory scoville and like they would come through and you'd just be like what the fuck because they're only a little bit older than me but they were like like a john mulaney you like watch that and you're like holy fuck that's good and i think that's like one of the most important parts of comedy, and it's it's why I probably will never leave New York City, is I love seeing a young comic that makes me feel as insecure as I did when I would watch Kinane or Scoville or Patton back in the day, where I would watch them and go like, I've got to go work harder. And I think that, you know, it rises, it, it brings everybody to a level. Because if you're insecure, like Kurt Metzger, was the guy that like when i moved to new york i would go watch him and then just be like oh fuck that's good like white precious to this day is one of my favorite specials of all time it's i think it's almost a perfect hour and it's just so goddamn funny and i love finding stuff like that i love finding the new thing that's gonna make me go like oh fuck i gotta go get way funnier you know all right, let me ask you one more thing that I'm curious about. Yeah. Because in, 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 there was a period where comics kind of would either die or get so fucked up they couldn't do it anymore, or they yeah. became actors and sitcom stars. I, yeah. mean, I mean, do you see yourself just being a comic yeah. until you retire or until you, yeah. until you quit? I'm going to push it. I think, you know, I think if you were asking me right now what my goals are, I'd probably say to push it as hard as I can for the next 20 to 25 years and then retire and like actually retire, like go away, um, probably live on a ranch or something with a bunch of dogs and my wife and and, um, you know, get a Rick Rubin beard and maybe show up on a couple podcasts once in a while. But I I think the um, I was very lucky to do billions. That's how we met. I was very, very lucky to get that opportunity. You know, Brian and David gave me an opportunity to be a part of a massive machine, a big show that was successful on a huge network. Uh, One for me. It was it was really cool. 
and I got to learn how to act. That was the most important thing is I, I, I learned how to act. And I, I wouldn't say I'm ne- I would never act again, but I, I, I am not. I was on Koppelman's podcast and he was like, well, what do you think about acting? And I was like, it's something I'm not going to pursue. Like if it, if it were like hypothetically, if Shane were to make a big movie, right. With McKeever and they were to ask me to play a role. Fucking of course, if Sam talent and I, we've had an idea kicking around a while that we might want to write and shoot. Well, that would just be like a side project. That would just be something where you're like, ah, this is fun. The main goal is, and will be until i die stand up you know i just i get that vibe about you i I feel that yeah yeah, i just feel like this um i feel like on the road is the start to a new chapter of just who i am as a comic and i feel like that's why calling it an ep and not an lp is like hey that's a warning shot that's just like that's just 40 minutes of like i'll see you in two to three more years with a full 60 minute hour that's going to be hopefully two to five times better than on the road was like, that's always the goal because I, I, you know, I was very lucky to get a comedy central hour, uh, a half hour and an hour. And I thought they were good. I thought they were okay. I thought the Netflix sucked. And then I think my HBO was like good. I thought on the road was better. And I, you know, and I just kind of want to keep climbing those stairs. I just kind of want to keep being like, and then the next one will be better than that. And then the next one. And it really is like, um, you know, it's a labor of love. So it's just kind of like, how much can I put into this? How much can I, uh, I don't, the, the idea of fame and notoriety don't, I've watched my friends get famous. It looks fucking miserable. I would just like to sell tickets and to grow with an audience. That's really what I would like to do. Oh, that's what you're doing. That's what you're doing. And I, I, I think on the road, it's my favorite of all your stuff now. Cause I know. Thanks, man. Stuff. And, I, you know, for me, I think, oh, how am I going to take this guy out? I'm going to have to do it in the air or the land. It's not going to be on a special. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, on, on the road. But I, I, I personally, I, I I love your stuff. I, Thanks. I, I, you know, and it's happening for you. It's, it, yeah. And that's a good attitude. It's, to me, having been around so many years now, I realize you're right, especially in the stand-up world. That that moment of that heat, flame, high rise, famous, you, two things happen: either the guy selling arenas he becomes an asshole, or a drug addict, or yeah. it it goes away. Yeah. Whereas whereas you just want to become great, like George Carlin did. Man, I watch everything that Colin Quinn does, and the one thing you know, Neil Brennan said this to me years ago probably about 10 years ago, Neil Brennan and I were sitting at the comedy cellar and he goes, you know whose career you want that no one talks about? Colin Quinn. He said four decades of being relevant in stand-up comedy and he keeps getting better. I just, you know, I was at a taping, I have it up on my wall for his special called Small Talk and it was one of the greatest hours I've ever seen in my life. It was poignant. It was funny. It had a, 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 a it had a, a thread the whole way through, and he didn't put it out. He didn't like his performance. He didn't like his beard. He didn't like the way it was shot. So he scrapped it. And I'm like, I, I see him, and I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? That hour was unbelievable. And he's like, hey, you know, I'll fucking, I don't know, I fucking, I'll figure something out. And you're like, and I love that. And I and I think creatively, that's where a lot of people. You know, well, that the great musicians, you know, to me, I've always admired singer songwriters, you know, and I feel like the great comics are becoming what the great singer songwriters are. Yeah. And that's why I call the I say it should be calling them album. Yeah. 18 months when they have a collection of songs, they do an album. Yeah. They don't have any songs. They don't do an album. Yeah. And, 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 there's, and, and, and you know, and, and I love I love the band Queens of the Stone Age and uh, they're a band I've followed for over 20 years. And I feel like uh, creatively, they're a band that um, that kind of sets the path. They're a good map. They every album you can tell they've been through something. They're different, but it's the same band. You know, it's still Josh Homme, but it's like um, it's an evolution on who he is. It's a growth on who he is. And then you just get this like they just put out an album called Times New Roman. It's just like perfect. And you're just like, yeah, this is 
and I agree with you. I think that's how comics should look at it. It's like, what's going to be the next album? Am I going to, where am I going to be where it's like, am I growing with my audience? Cause you know, you talk about those arena guys and what happens is they get to these arenas and, or, or that's how it used to be was they'd get to these arenas and go like, well, what filled it? Okay. Well, I got to keep doing that where in reality, what it is, is it's like, no, keep going. Like maybe this part of your career is arenas, but keep, artistically growing so that the next album your fans will follow you maybe it not it might not be all those people you know what i mean and, and i've learned that from from changes that i've had in the past couple of years of leaving the bonfire and leaving other stuff it's like you're gonna lose people but you're gonna gain a lot more it's like it's right. like pruning you know you're like cutting some off for more for a for a better growth and like a lot of people came with me but there are people that were like, nah, man, I liked you at this stage of your career. You know, as a Queens of the Stone Age fan, I, I see it all the time where people are like, they need to do another album like Songs for the Deaf. And you're like, well, that was 2003. And they were they were young and they were like doing drugs and like fucking around. Now they're in their mid to late 40s and 50s and they're singing about being who they are now. And I like that idea. I like that idea of 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 don't. Don't let the success dictate how you grow artistically. Go yourself, and if there's if it's there, it's there. But like people now that are do, like Nate Bargetsy's doing arenas, but I see Nate just continuing on because Nate has been the same. He's been that's consistent right. that's since, right. since 2007. You know, yeah, he's been growing. That's right. He he feels very much in that singer songwriter world. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Luke Bryan ass motherfucker. <laughs> he's like, I got my truck and my wife and my dog and my bed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. dude good talking to you man great talking to you man and i'm yeah. so happy for you thanks and, dude. Uh, and hope to see you soon and yeah, dude. Hey, Look. anyone listening if you're not gonna turn this off and watch on the road just something's wrong with you chemically <laughs> something's just biologically uh, you know yeah. but uh, i appreciate that man get it fixed get it fixed see a doctor yeah have some kind of enema <laughs> and then watch on the road you rule, dude. Thank you so much, and I'll see you when you come to New York. Okay, cool. All right, bye, guys. All right. Love that guy. Love that guy. Check out On the Road on YouTube. It is so good. And he's also he's touring all through Jan, all through 2024. He's on so the road. He's on the road. That's right. <laughs> I didn't make that connection. <laughs> come on, Mike. <laughs> But he's uh, he's on the road and he's great and love the guy. So check that out. Also, don't forget April twenty first. I am in Detroit at the Royal Oak Theater with a night of laughter with RFK Jr. fundraiser for my buddy Bobby Kennedy with Rob Schneider and Heather J and Trey Stewart. Dave Landau, and just uh, the list goes on. Some great comics. So come on down and see us and meet Bobby Kennedy and hear him talk. And it's going to be a great night. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thanks for your support at Apple and Spotify. And please comment and follow and whatever there is to do on all those things. We really appreciate it for the growth, for the help, whatever. Love you. Have a great week.